Under a light dome, like here in Yokohama, Japan, the dominance of the Orion constellation is unchallenged in the winter skies. No other star configuration even comes close. It has been a source of beauty and fascination that dates millennia back into the past from Egypt to Japan. From 85 degrees north to 75 degrees south latitudes, it can be seen. Its dominance is partly due to the close proximity of its many stars and celestial objects near to our solar system. Here in a minor spiral arm within the Milky Way galaxy, sometimes called the Orion Spur or the Orion Cygnus Arm. In addition to the constellation's magnificent bright stars, throughout the region is a blanket of diffuse gas and dust that glows dimly, but also is spotted with pockets of dense, gaseous, star-forming regions. Some of it visible to the naked eye under dark, dark skies, and much of it within reach of our amateur astrophotography equipment. There are so many interesting deep sky objects within the Orion constellation. For me, I find that this particular area of Bernard's Loop is especially intriguing. Perhaps the best picture of it that I have ever seen is this one taken by Tadayoshi Kosugi at the Fujigane Remote Observatory in Yamanashi, Japan. It is a dense star field with colorful stars and emission and dark nebulae forming eerie and interesting patterns. This boxed area covers four to five arc degrees of sky requiring wide field focal lengths and or big sensors to capture it fully. So here is my setup. My equipment is controlled by the ASI Air Mini and driven by the AM3 mount both from ZWO. My astrograph lens is from ASCAR, the FMA-135, an APO triplet design that I have paired with the ASI 533MC color camera. Most of the image data I captured for this project was taken in my backyard in Yokohama, Japan in February and March, as you can see in these photos. In prior videos, I have frequently praised this OTA camera pairing as a great combination for wide field imaging. With the IMX533 sensor, the combination covers 4.5 arc degrees of sky, giving beautiful wide field views. But technically, if you are a pixel peeper, you will find that this combination actually results in significant undersampling, missing out on finer details. However, for me, it's not a concern since I seldom ever enlarge any of the images for poster or wall framing. I simply like it, and the cost performance of this combination is fantastic. Since I started this project late in the winter, Orion was already past the meridian at around sunset, so my imaging time per night was rather limited due to the neighboring houses. But over the course of six nights, I was able to accumulate 119 good five-minute subframes for a total of 595 minutes of exposure time. And during these imaging sessions, I used exclusively the Optolong L-Extreme dual narrowband filter. Here is the image I was able to create from nearly 10 hours of narrowband data. Frankly, it's not bad. I could achieve some good resolution on each of the deep sky objects that I wanted to see. But experience has taught me that supplementing narrowband with some broadband images usually enhances the final image significantly. So I attempted imaging with a UV IR cut filter. But being already March, Orion could only be seen in the early evening and it was also a bit low in altitude. You can see that under the Bortle 7 to 8 class skies of Yokohama, the light pollution gradient on my images was too intense to handle in post-processing. So I gave up and made a decision to visit darker skies at the earliest opportunity to collect the desired broadband data. My opportunity came on Friday, March 21st. On this particular night, there was a 60% waning gibbous moon, but it did not rise until 11.39 p.m. And since it gets quite dark by 7 p.m., there seemed to be ample time to capture dark sky data for perhaps several hours. I decided to make this a Higayeri trip. 
In Japanese, higaeri means to go and come back on the same day. For this kind of trip, I already knew the best destination, the Izu Peninsula. From Shin Yokohama near to my house, the best site for a higaeri trip was Izutaga. I was there previously four months ago with my Move Shoot Move equipment. I published a video on that trip in episode 45. And by the way, perhaps some of you recognize Jogashima Island on this map near the bottom, where I have also done some darker sky imaging that resulted in three prior videos as well. Keep that in mind, it becomes relevant later. So, during the mid-afternoon of March 21st, I found myself on the Shinkansen bullet train platform at Shin Yokohama Station as the train rolled in. Oh, take a look at this coffee machine on the platform. Have you ever seen anything so comprehensive? They have every option imaginable. Double shot soy latte, anyone? This is a view of the city of Atami looking eastward toward the bay located just beyond these buildings. Here, I transferred to the local railway line and traveled only two stops to reach Izutaga Station, my final destination. As usual for any destination, I did a little pre-scouting on Google Earth prior to this trip. I found an interesting hillside overlook circled here in yellow. That particular site was labeled Sakura Spot Walking Path on the map. It appeared to be directly accessible from Izutaka Station and not too far to walk. And since cherry blossoms, Sakura in Japanese, were just beginning to bloom, I thought it might be a great place to do some astrophotography surrounded by blossoms. Wouldn't that be unique? So I found the path from the station and walked along this nice pedestrian road, snaking across the hillside. I had high hopes, but almost immediately those were quashed when I saw that the pathway was illuminated by closely spaced artificial lighting. The overlook was quite nice, providing a beautiful view of the bay and towns down below. But because of the lights and a slightly blocked view to the west, which I did not expect, I gave up on this location. Uh, besides, there were no cherry blossoms yet anyways. After considering all options, I decided it was best to go down to the seaside and do some imaging from one of the breakwater piers you can see here in this photograph. Unfortunately, it was a steep meandering path to get down there and by the time I got on the pier, I had already walked 1,800 meters, or more than one mile. Now, that may not sound like much for a physically fit senior, unless you are carrying this load, which, trust me, can feel quite heavy after a while. But I made it, and I decided on using the left side of the southern pier. The last time I was here, I actually used the other pier, Again, that adventure was published in Astrophotography Japan episode 45 back in December of last year. This pier was actually a bit wider and closer to the shore, but unfortunately it too had some lighting. However, I strategically selected my imaging site to be such that the lighting was in the opposite direction of my imaging target, so the illumination was not an issue whatsoever. The imaging rig I used was exactly the same as I used earlier in my backyard. In fact, I never even unattached the FMA 135 lens from the camera for the entire month. So that preserved the orientation of the field of view for more productive stacking in post-processing. Notice the location of my tiny rig where I set it up low to the ground and close to the concrete wall that curved a bit from south to west. Although this particular night had clear skies and mild temperatures, there was a troublesome wind, especially out there on the exposed pier. But that concrete barrier did a great job to block most of it. 
and thanks to the sturdy AM3 mount, every subframe I took that evening was suitable for stacking. The imaging was uneventful with everything working flawlessly. The skies were beautiful, and I tested out my new Canon RF 16mm lens for the first time. I purchased this lens for extreme wide-field Milky Way photography, which I will employ in the coming summer months. Essentially, all of the photos you see on this Higayeti trip were taken with the 16mm lens on my Canon EOS R8 camera. My first subframe that night was taken at 7.08 p.m. and the last one taken at 9.13. During that time, the target moved from 50 degrees altitude down to about 30 degrees altitude near to the west. I took 180 second exposures using the Zviboni 2 inch UV IR cut filter. Here is what a single exposure looked like compared to the exposure I took previously in Yokohama with the same OTA and filter. Both are 180 second subframes. There was a dramatic difference in the light pollution level, actually, more than I expected. Because even though the website reference maps say that Izutaga is Bordel Class 4 territory, the skies seem a bit brighter than that to me. Nevertheless, I was happy with the single frame results and continued with good confidence that this imaging night was going to be productive. Here are a few ASI Air screenshots that show single frame subframes from both locations, with histogram data displayed below. Notice the average sensor illumination intensity. These values show that the overall light captured was more than five times less here in Izu than in Yokohama. What these values actually mean and how they can be interpreted relative to Bortle scale, I have no idea. But it is interesting to see the relative values nevertheless. So on this night, I captured 41 subframes or 123 minutes of total data. Every single frame was artifact free. In the following days, after I returned home, I stacked and processed these UV IR cut data files and this is the image that I could develop. You can see better star color, more luminosity in the M78 reflection nebula to the upper right, and a region of Barnard's loop and other features as well. On the right of this slide is the narrow band data from Yokohama that we saw earlier. There is quite a difference depending on these locations and filters. In total, when combined, I managed to get 160 subframes and 718 minutes of data, which is nearly 12 hours of exposure time. For me, this is the most I ever dedicated to one deep sky target. And here is the combined, stacked, and developed image. Uh, but you know, this was not the first time I imaged the Boogeyman Dark Nebula and M78, the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. About five months prior to this video, I imaged these two targets separately with a more powerful telescope from Jogashima Island, another Bortle Class IV territory. Frankly, that particular night was the best night of astrophotography I ever experienced, and another video well worth watching. A link is provided in the description. Here are all the images I captured of these targets. The central one is at 135mm focal length, and the two zoomed images are at 288mm focal length. I'm very pleased with this wide field image that I developed from seven different nights of imaging with two different filters and at two different locations. It is amazing how amateur software such as Ciro, which I used for stacking, is able to assemble all 160 subframes together in a single clear image such as the one you see here. I needed to crop a little bit, so this image ended up being 4.47 by 4.22 degrees of sky, as reported here by astrometry.net in the analysis of my photo. And Telescopius was good at labeling all the dark nebulae that are cataloged and found throughout this region. 
It took me about 30 minutes to break down and pack up all the equipment and another 20 minutes or so to lug it back up the hillside to Izutaka Station. That added another half mile to my backpacking adventure on this night. I knew then sore muscles were to be expected in the coming days. I was planning to take the 1020 train back to Atami. Not surprisingly, there was no one other than me at the station late on this Friday night. And, as expected, the train was right on schedule. I had the train car all to myself for the two stops and eight minutes it took to reach Atami. From there, I was back to Shin Yokohama by 11.05 p.m. and home well before midnight. This was a big project for me. It was nearly a month-long effort, chipping away at it for seven nights in February and March when the skies were being cooperative. You know, astrophotography is a remarkable and interesting hobby. It requires a lot of planning and especially a lot of patience. Thanks for watching and supporting this channel. I appreciate all the comments and encouragement and advice. I have never claimed to be an expert in this field. I don't really even own much premium brand equipment. My intention is just to chronicle my adventures, explain, and entertain. For me, that is simply my enjoyment. Here in Yokohama, I am JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and you have been watching Astrophotography Japan.